We've got a couple slides to give you a little introduction, and then we're actually going to build some stuff from scratch. Um, there's nothing in the scenes. We'll, we'll, we'll see how this goes. It could go horribly wrong, and we've got some backups just in case. But all right, so this is who we are. I'm a product manager. So product management is working with you guys, trying to figure out what Unity should build. And one of the big sort of echoes that we've heard over the last little while is that we need to make it e easier to use for artists. So a timeline is sort of the first wave of many things that you'll see over the next couple releases going on through the next few years um, from Unity. And we're very, very excited about it. And hopefully, you can get a sense of some of the cool things you can do with it. I'm Adam. I gave birth to Cine Machine and spend most of my day uh, making gameplay and uh, cinematic camera tools. So what is Timeline? So I, this is a very simple uh, introduction. It's a multi-track sequencer in Unity. Uh, it's NLE workflows, nonlinear editing. The whole idea is that you can drag any object from your scene into Timeline, add animations. It's got a full key, key framing workflow audio, um, we've got uh, experimental for even dragging the new, we've got the video player that was in 5.6. You can actually bring that into timeline and start to actually really syn synchronize and uh, integrate all these things into anything that synch uh, is spaced over time. The original Atom short was built with an uh, early version of timeline. So that's sort of the level of what you can do. And then obviously we can uh, integrate it into gameplay as well. It's definitely not just for cutscenes. The way that Timeline was built is that it's meant to be very performant, very fast, and very extensible. So you can use hundreds, there can be hundreds of timelines in your scenes for all the different objects and interactions. And I'll show you some examples of that. Sin Machine, turn the problem around. Don't animate your cameras. Tell your cameras what you'd like to shoot, and then have them animate themselves. Give them intent, say how you'd like to compose something, and then you'll get the shot. And then amazingly, when you go away and someone comes into work, on the weekend and changes everything, you'll find that it's still working, hopefully, in most cases. So it's kind of like IK for cameras. Uh, and it's not just cinematic. So we've demoed a lot of Cinemachine cinematic stuff, but there's a long laundry list of gameplay camera uh, components in there. So different follow modes, uh, collision systems, free look orbit systems, and we're going to get into some of those today. All right. So let's see it in action. That's literally all the slides we've got. So, here we have in the kiosk booth demo area, we have a little demo we created with the Ghost of a Tail um, assets. These are beautiful assets that Seath let us borrow. And uh, right now, we don't have any cinema machine in the scene at all. And now we've got a chord party going on. Um, so all I've got is a character controller that I created, which is this guy. And it's actually just using the normal Unity character controller. And I've set up some camera relative movement. Um, he moves around, and there's no actual animations or anything. So one of the first things I want to do is I want to trigger this door open. So when you, when you walk near it, I want it to open up. So in the door, I have set up this box that's lit on the green box on the bottom here. And it's set up as a trigger. You can see I've got a collider on it with as trigger set up. So I'm actually going to drag out a simple script. Let me lock the door. Actually, no, I'll just drag it up. So I've just got a generic trigger script. Now this trigger, I'll open up some code. Hopefully Adam has Visual Studio installed. Here's the one playing. So here I'll zoom in a bit. So this is about as simple of a trigger script as you can get. We have our on trigger enter, on trigger exit. When you enter the trigger, it's going to play a timeline. You can see we've got the, at the very top here, once I get rid of this, we've got a playable director. So that is essentially the timeline component. So the playable director, you can just get a handle, a handle to it here. So in this case, I'm just going to find the component in the object that I've attached this script to. When a game object that's tagged as player enters that zone, it's going to play the timeline. When I leave, it's going to stop the timeline. So let's take a look at that. So I've added it to this object, but I don't have a timeline on it. Luckily, I've got my new timeline window on the bottom here. And it's saying, to create, begin a new timeline with the door, add a component. So we'll just start and call this one my door timeline. In the root folder? <laughs> this is where our OCD comes out. And 
<laughs> All right, I'll stick it in a folder. That's fine, that's fine. <laughs> so, okay, so now what you'll see what we've done, or what just hitting create, so we have our generic trigger. We now have a playable director component, and it also adds an animator. So all of the animations uh, timeline, it actually depends on the animator. We're looking at maybe changing how that works, but for now, it uses the animator. And that's it. At this point, if I play the, or activate the trigger, the timeline will play. But it doesn't do much yet. So uh, let's go under the door asset and find the mesh. So this is the actual door mesh. And I want to animate it so it opens when the thing triggers. So I'm going to lock my timeline. And I can just drag the door mesh down. When you drag any game object from your scene onto timeline, it asks you what you want to do with it. You can activate it. So this is the same as calling game object set active or deactive. Um, so you can activate game objects if you want a specific thing to only exist for the duration of that timeline sequence. You can make an animation track or an audio track. If there's an audio source or something in there, you can actually add those in. And then there's obviously a Cinemachine track because we've got Cinemachine loaded in. In this case, I want to make an animation track. So now we've got our door with the trigger, and I've added our mesh on to animate. I can just hit record. Oh, I'm in play mode. That's why I can't record. OK, now I broke my timeline. OK, oh, yeah. All right, we're going to do that again quickly. Timeline, door. Yes. In the root folder. <laughs> Come on. I had to. <laughs> Animation. Now. OK. Now we can hit record. So the, the track goes, can you even see that? The track goes red. It's, you can it says recording. Can you... It says recording. You'll have to trust me there. The screen's not too. Uh... Yeah. Uh, so now that it's recording, we've got um, basically these notches on the top. By default, it's frames. You can set it to seconds. So I know I want the door to animate up over a certain number of seconds. So when I select my door mesh, um, now that I'm animating, I can actually right click on any of these properties here and hit uh, add key, or you can update key. So I'll just add a rotation one as well. And once you've added keys, you can see that it this curve editor here, you can actually open it up and see what the curves are. So I've set a key at the beginning. I'll say it opens over three seconds. Just have to drag, and then just literally move it where I want it to be. And it's already done that animation. So it's it, keyframing in timeline is super quick. So now that I'm going to leave it open for a few seconds, and I'll add another key. And then we'll go back down to zero. And I'll actually make it zero. All right, make sure that there's keys. OK, so now our full sequence, if we walk up to it, it opens up, stays open for a few seconds, and then closes. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, so I can leave record mode, and I'll close that down. Now, in our mouse, again, it's all set up. I've got my. Trigger script? No, I lost my trigger script. Let's put that back on. Your mouse is twitchy. Generic trigger. OK. So you can also, I could just, like I've got the public reference here. I could drag it in, but it's going to, my script is going to look for the component. So now, in theory, oh no, let's fix the camera. Why do you have the, you've uh, already got Cinemachine on it. Oops. Purge Cinemachine. So I'm going to put the camera out here so I can see what's going on. So now I can run around. Oh, oh it opened up start automatically. Start on play. Play on awake. So our timelines, by default, are set to play on awake. And this means that as soon as the scene loads, it will play. You can also set them up to loop if you actually want to create background elements or things in, that are just sort of ambient. You can actually set them to play when your scene awakes, and they'll just loop and kind of do their thing. In this case, because I want to trigger it, I don't want it to play on awake. So I can now run around, and theoretically, when I enter that zone, the, the thing should play. There you go. 
Um, so get, integrating timeline into your into your actual gameplay is is pretty simple. It's that straight. Yeah. So, okay. So we've got our door working. Um, next, I'm going to unhide this guy, which is our chests that we open up. So this one we can do a, some a little bit more complicated things. So I actually want to add some animation for the mouse in there as well. So I'll un lock that. So when our chest interact, this one's actually a little bit more of a complicated script because it, I've got it to show some UI elements and a couple other things. Uh, at its core, that's what it's doing, is calling timeline.play when it gets triggered. Now, we'll just create a timeline for it in the root folder. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. <laughs> All right, now this one here, uh, let's see, what do I want to open? I want to open the lid. So we'll lock our timeline again. That lock thing's really important, otherwise when you deselect the timeline, it pops off, so it's good to just pin that up, so yeah. the interface stays up. Okay, so lid, we'll drag it down. I'm gonna make also an animation track. And make sure I'm not in play mode. Start animating that. And then I'll select my lid, set a keyframe, move out again. We'll open it over a couple seconds. Add a key. I want my thing to be on my pivot. So I'll rotate it. Stay open for a few seconds. Add a keyframe. You're neglecting your calling as an animator. Uh, I'm really good at this stuff, let me tell you. There you go. Okay. So again, same basic principle. We're setting an object to record. We're setting some keyframes, and then you play. Now, this one's we're going to do, we want to do a little bit more interesting. So the mouse is going to walk up and actually push it open. So I'll drag the mouse down and drop him on, and I want to make an animation track as well. But this time, I'm not going to keyframe his individual animations, because the animators are much better at that stuff. So all I want to do is find his animations. And they're somewhere down here. Let me see. I think I've got some in here. So I've got a, let's see. Oh, oh what did that do to the mic? Open, open chest, I'll put that down here. Now these are existing clips that were created in Maya or Max or whatever the uh, animators used. And I'll just drag them in. So actually, I'll open the chest. I think I also need a hide basin and exit basin. I'm just gonna drop them on and then we'll organize them later. And hidden in basin. So there's nothing special about these clips. Again, they're just FBX files that were loaded in using the normal um, import pipeline. And we can just organize them on timeline now. I'll just figure out which one's which. Put you over there. OK, so first we're going to open the chest. Then we're going to hide in the basin. Then we're going to exit, a ba exit the basin somewhere over here. And we'll while we're hiding, we'll do this idle hidden in basin. Okay, so my awesome animation skill. Let's just see what that looks like. So he opens it, jumps in, he's idle, and then he jumps out. He almost gets squishes. All right, so you can obviously tweak these things. So we'll move that over there. So you can see how quickly you can actually get things working in timeline. Um, experimenting with ideas. And in this case, let's see if we've got everything. We've got our trigger on. Again, it's just a collider with a trigger. Um, in this case, I'll just do this just so you can. So we'll put it, say it's the timeline. This one's, okay, we'll say it's interactive. It's got some stuff. Okay, so now I'm going to give this a try. Oh, no. Let me, uh, oh, that play on awake got me again. All right, we'll focus on him a little bit. 
and in our chest. We'll uncheck play on awake. Now this one again is a little more complicated, so I've got a, a key to. I have to press a key on the controller to actually activate it. So it opens the chest, jumps in, hides there for a little while, and then jumps out. So we've created this whole thing just there. You know, and my timing is worse. Poor little mouse guy. <laughs> All right, let's fix that so it doesn't look so painful. And then he's actually got an idle default that we'll put at the end. All right, so that's about the basics for, time, for getting timeline working. Um, audio is the same. You can put mouse, let's see, we've got a mouse squeak. We'll put him in here. Um, so you drag audio clips on, and it just makes an audio, um, audio track. Now, each audio track can point to any audio source you have in your scene. This allows you to do 2D positioning or 3D positioning, 2D um, soundtracks. Um, all kinds of stuff. So I've got a mixer over here, and I just have to put a, oh, we'll stick an audio source on our camera, just because I'm lazy. Audio source. And we'll put that in here, and that audio source will point at our mixer. Uh, we'll call this Foley. And then Timeline will actually drive which audio clip is being played um, because through the track here. Um, I don't think the audio is working on the laptop, but that's the basic principle. So you have tracks, audio clips on Timeline, pipe to audio sources that allow you to do your 3D positioning in your world. And then I'm not cutting you off, Mike. I'm just, I mean, you're putting stuff in the root folder. Adam's OCD is going to force him to do track some... groups. So you can organize right. your tracks using this track group concept and it allows you to actually group things together. Once you start getting more than a few tracks, you'll, you want to, you'll start grouping them together. So this is all the stuff related to the mouse. So it makes sense to put that into a specific group so you can actually have things organized a little bit. And then you can collapse them as well. So now he's got the audio and the mouse. So he can hide that stuff away and do his... Uh, oh, I put audio in the mouse. You, you can, can also them. nest the groups. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to do that. Yeah. OK, so now that we've okay. got some basic timeline happening, um, this static camera that I've got for the gameplay is probably not going to do it. So let's see if we can add a free look into there to start, and then we can add some Cinemachine magic. OK, so I'm going to load Cinemachine into the project. Uh, you can get it right off the asset store. I'm not sure what the internet is. I'm just going to load it from my machine, but you can just pull it straight off the asset store. It's free. And you can see my Google Drives right now. OK, so I'm just going to take the latest in machine. You were claim complaining about my organization. <laughs> sort of by date. OK, so it's already here. All right. So this is uh, Sin Machine puts a little tab up at the top. And here's how it works. The first thing you do is just create a virtual camera. And you notice a few things happen. We create a virtual camera. And a virtual camera is not a real camera. It's actually very little. It's super light. And it's just, uh, it's basically just a transforms where it's looking and where it's positioned. And what Cinemachine does is it blends as many virtual cameras as you want. You're going to see we're going to blend a few. Uh, I've had 21 different free look rig systems blending for uh, character locomotion systems. So we'll show you a little bit about that. But basically what it does is it just blends all these virtual cameras. And then it comes up with a final set of transforms. And it gives it to the main camera. So this is the main Unity camera. We don't touch it. We just kind of marry and edit. And you can see there's this thing called the Cinemachine brain. And basically, the brain looks for the virtual cameras in the scene, does all its crazy blending stuff, and then goes, here, camera, and do this. And we do that because it's light, and we don't have multiple cameras in the scene. We've got some stuff like debug text, so you can see which camera's active, which is really cool. And then we've got a world up override. So if you're doing like an RTS or you're looking down, you can put a dummy object in there and bend it all down. And one of the reasons we do that is because we've got some really sophisticated blending math in there. And it turns out that the math to emulate how a cameraman is, which is really kind of like a horizon-based thing, um, falls apart when you go over uh, the poles. So you get gimbal lock, right? So we actually blend between these different math systems 
uh, depending on um, you know if you're going over the poles or not. So if you've got a game that's really looking down, you can put in uh, like a world up override, so your up can be whatever you want it to be. And then we have this thing called Smart Update. And basically what we do is we look to see if it's being anim animated in timeline or if it's physics, and we actually adjust the update method of the camera to prevent from jitters. Uh, and then the default blend. So if I don't define a custom blend, I can, it'll just, every camera blend's gonna be ease in and ease out of two seconds, but it can be cuts or whatever. And then custom blends. So I'm gonna get into that in a sec. Okay, so we wanna do, we wanna use this thing, we wanna do like an orbit camera, like a free looky kind of thing. So we've got one of those, and it's just called free look. And here it is. And it's three rigs. It's a top rig, a middle rig, and a bottom rig. So we're just gonna pick the mouse here. I got the free look, and I'm gonna just say, look at the mouse. I'm just gonna do it on the top one. Look at the mouse, follow the mouse. And we give you some defaults. They're not the greatest defaults because I don't know what your game is, but they're okay defaults, but you're gonna wanna change them. And how it works is, is we listen to an input. We're gonna hook the controller up, but right now it's, it auto configures to mouse. And we, you have controls for spinning the camera, and then you have your controls for height. And what Cinemachine does is it makes this, I'm gonna just make this window bigger. It makes this rig. And the rig has got three rings. Can you guys see that on there? It's like a little three, we got a lower red ring here, a middle ring and an upper ring. And this value blends the camera between them. We've got a spline tension, so you can like make it a little bit, uh, can you see that? I'm kind of making it a bit more robotic-y or spliny. And what this does is this lets you craft the position and everything about the camera at each of those three states. So look at this. This top camera is pretty bad. So we're just going to recompose it. So we can just say, no, I want him to be a little lower in the screen on the top. Let's go a little bit higher. And um, the middle camera, I'm going to zoom down a little bit. It's easier. There we go. That's like terrible. So the middle camera, we're gonna change the composition. We're gonna do it to this. You can even do offsets, because we're targeting the guy's root bone. So I'm gonna show you the guides. Let me turn these on. Go to common lens settings. Actually, I'll turn this off. Uh, okay, and then on the bottom camera. So you kind of get where I'm going. We're setting these cameras up for each one. And the bottom one's terrible. And why don't we do something crazy? Why don't we like go with a wide angle lens on the bottom one, and why don't we look up? Some more. Oh, you don't want to look sideways. Typically, you can. And look up. Okay, so now we got this free. This is, you know, it's it's a setting. It's not too it's not too crazy, but it's all right. Okay, so then the last thing we do is we're gonna go and change our input. And what was it again? Controller. Camera. X. Camera. Uh, X. Camera Y. And like that, you have a, not great, but functioning. Your other free, your virtual camera. Oh yeah, sorry. Thank you, I'll just turn that off. Or we'll just set this to a higher priority. Great time, time to talk about priorities. Okay. I'll touch on that. When you get into really big gameplay camera rigs, you've got like lots of different cameras that are, you've got a camera for when you're running, when you're standing, when you're walking, maybe a camera when you're getting attacked by some guy or you fall through the floor, whatever your game has. So we have a really robust priority system that allows you to have certain cameras override other cameras. That's a, basically a talk into itself, but uh, it's, it's there so you can build up these really elaborate state machine setups. Okay, so I'm going to split the screen. You can see now that we got this free look. I'm looking around. And it's not bad. We've got acceleration, deceleration controls, and a number of features in there that if you're doing these kinds of cameras, you'll be hopefully happy that we've put in there because uh, I worked on a third-person action-adventure game and learned a lot about free look camera systems. and. Uh, tried to get as many of those ideas in here. Okay, that's cool. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna duplicate this guy. 
going to call this free look uh, sneak. And on this one, I'm going to just do something really obvious. So Cinemachine has a multi-channel Perlin noise uh, system. And OK, so we made a lot. I've got you started. We've got a few in here. I'm just going to call normal mild. And what this does is you've got each axis. So you've got orientation, x, y, z, and position, x, y, z. And you can add as many as you want. Right now, I've got three orientation procedural noise layers going. And the reason why three is you can go more. It just turns into a sea of numbers. I like to mix like really low frequency noise with a little bit of mid frequency and then just a touch of high frequency. And you get a not a bad handheld -y kind of vibe off that. So I'm just going to show you this really quickly. You can see we've got you know, amplitude 7. Amplitude is in degrees, and frequency is in hertz. So 7 degrees, 15, blah, blah, blah. And we've got this. And it's, it's not a bad little, little handheld noise. And you've got one for each camera, so low, medium, and high. So you can put different, you know, if you're down close and you're on the bottom camera, you can have less. So I'm going to just be crazy. I'm going to do an extreme on the mid camera and a barely any noise on the bottom camera. So we've now got these uh, wide, strong. Like this is totally bananas. It's way too much. OK. And then just turn this guy off for a sec. And we play the game. And it's thinking about something for some reason. And this guy should be super shaky. OK, so you can see we've got some handheld on there. This is too much. I'm making an example. And when we go to the top, there's we're blending seamlessly to the other little bit of handheld. You probably don't want to put handhelds on your main free look cameras, but there's times where you do. And then we have, I guess this one a bit more than I thought, but you get the picture. This is where it gets interesting. So you get these two free looks. So I'm going to do a new module here called State Driven Camera. This, if I had this on a previous project, I might not have come as close to suicide as I did. That's a joke, slightly. What this thing does is, uh, where'd it go? State Driven Camera. So I'm going to drag the two free looks into here. Delete this guy. Unhide the sneak. Come on. And what this guy does is the state driven camera. Why is it not turning off? Uh, OK, I'll look at that in a second. The state driven camera will scrub your scene and it will look for events. So I'm going to make two states. Do we not have any uh, mechanism going in here? That's a bit of a problem. She's not making anything. All right. Um, I'll see. This guy? Yeah. OK. So look at this. We pointed state-driven camera to the mouse animator. And then we pick the state. And we've got all sorts of things. Like, this is all the mechanism states or all the animation states that are in the game. So I'm going to make one that is, like, we haven't hooked up most of this stuff. So we're going to just look for the sneak one. It's in there somewhere. And it's in here somewhere. Uh, locomotion sneak. Thank you. And then we're going to call the sneak camera. We're going to go, we're not going to wait. You've got to wait. You've got a minimum time. And then we're going to go, when we go from sneak, locomotion sneak, back to walk. Oops. I'm going to go that one back to the free look one. OK. Then we're going to make some custom blends. And look at this. Create asset. I'm going to put it in the root. Uh-huh. Until it comes around. OK. In so here we go. Root folder. <laughs> We're going to make a new blend tree. So when I come from free look one to sneak, I want to take two seconds. When I come from sneak back to free look, I want to take, so I'm going to flip that. That's going to be two seconds to go back. We've just built a state machine, a very basic one, but we're now basically linking camera behaviors with animations. There we go. Hit it. That should do it. All right, so we're in one camera. That works. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create a virtual camera. And we're going to put this onto timeline. So look at this. We can just take the Cinemachine camera. We throw it onto timeline. We create a Cinemachine track. 
And then we take the virtual camera and we make a clip. And we're gonna create a shot for that. We're gonna look at the mouse. I'm just gonna go through to find something on his face, like his eye. Okay, so watch this. So we've got this camera and we're gonna look at his nose bone. So we've got gameplay that's happening here and then we slide into this and we go to this camera. I'm just gonna move this. Cinema Machine works in both directions so you can you can move it so you can move the camera obviously it tracks the subject. And I'm just gonna move the lens up on this guy. Move this down. And change where we're composing it on the screen. Okay, and then I'm gonna make two more clips, which are the gameplay blends. And what we're gonna show you here is how you can seamlessly go from any game from gameplay, which is gonna be frame look one. We're gonna make another one. And that's free look one as well. Okay, so we go from gameplay into this, hold this for a little bit, and then back. All right, let's do that. So we go through, we trigger the timeline. Whoa. Oh, is it this guy? Yeah. Oh, oh. We don't have colliders on there yet. We hit Y, we play, we go from gameplay, we seamlessly push into this camera, we're tracking his face, and then he comes back out. So this is a quick and pretty crude uh, little demo, but what we'd like to you to take away from this is how fast it is to throw these cinematic, hybrid -y gameplay to cutscene moments uh, together with doing very little work. So I'm gonna just do that one more time. And then the other thing is, is because it's, uh, we save and play in edit mode, the ch that we save in play mode, the changes that you make uh, are preserved. So watch this. We go in, back and it's like, no, you know what, that's not good. I'm gonna just pause it right here. Move this back. You know, you can recompose the shot. We're really aggressively following his nose, obviously. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna decouple that a little bit. We've got these damping controls. And what that lets you do is that lets you follow a little less aggressively. I'm just gonna pull the lens back here. I'm gonna pull this whole camera back because it's really hard to see what's happening. So you can drive that mic, thank you. Okay, so what you see here is the red area, the target's never gonna leave the red area, like this, the red little mouse target, the nose, is never gonna leave these red boundaries, which you can set. And you can kind of see here, I'll just pull it over, you can see there's like a little dead zone, is that showing up right here? And that means all the, mo all the motion that's inside that little range is gonna be disregarded. So if you have like a, a character with like a, a, like a looping animation cycle or something, the camera's not going to uh, follow that. And then we've got these damping controls. And you can see I just turned them to zero, so now the camera's like hard pinned to the subject. I'm just gonna move the camera around so you can see his face a little bit more. See that like super hard pin, super gamey. And these tracked offsets, these are in local space to the character. So what I can do is I can offset them a little bit, like say you just wanted to like choke or just slightly recompose, move the bone around where it is. I'm gonna show you these dampening again, like crank up the horizontal dampening, and now he can move back and forth horizontally in the frame. Let me crank the field of view up a little bit more. But vertically, he's perfectly pinned. And then vice versa. Now he's got a little bit of vertical movement, but horizontally he's pinned. And it's not a lot of controls, but you'll find that I haven't found situations where I'd like, oh, I just wish I had an extra control for this or for that. Like this is, um, it, it covers in you know, most cases. So, gameplay, cutscenes, gameplay, 
and back. All right. All right, what else do we want to do here? You gonna add a camera to my door or is it? No? Yeah, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you one more thing with this. We're gonna blend these guys. I'm gonna make one more free look. I'm gonna make one more virtual camera here. And show you this. So this is gonna target the mouse again. We're gonna create a virtual camera for that. We're gonna target his nose again. And we're just gonna change the composition on that and you can see how we can blend these guys together. So camera one has got a really soft composition. Camera two has got, we're gonna move this somewhere else. Virtual camera three. I'm just gonna move this somewhere else. And you guys get the idea. It's really, really quickly you can start laying down camera behaviors. And it, we, we made it so it works backwards too. Like sometimes you wanna work completely in play mode and save all your tunings and that's cool and great. But then sometimes you wanna work in edit mode like I am right now. And the game's not playing, but I'm still getting to, you know, I'm still able to tune and we do all the blending. So here I'm doing a really obnoxious David Hitchcock Zolly on this guy. And it works both directions. So you can see you can, okay, we hit, let's make this bigger. We hit play and away it goes. Click on the yeah, there you go, Mike. All right. So we'll run around over here. Come back. You clicked out of the game window. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> now we can hit play. And now blend between the, the different cameras that were set up. Come back. With an obnoxious Ollie. And then we're back to gameplay. So we hope these things, you know, in your hands, you can, you can blur the lines and, and add cinematic elements to gameplay or steal the gameplay camera over for a little bit. And, you know, you've just got these tools that uh, we hope makes it really easy for you guys to, to craft your, your gameplay camera experiences. How are we doing for time? 42. So let me, uh, let me just jump into another scene that we've created here. Um, I think we still got it in this project. So this is a different example where we actually recreated the intro sequence from Ghost of a Tale. So it just, just to show you that you, it's not just 3D elements, it's actually all the different things. Oh, except I deleted the timeline sequence. Oh, oh no. All right, all right. I've got it on three, four. I've got it on here. You do? All yeah. right. We'll load the other project that's actually in the kiosk and just show you that one. Um, UI elements, uh, particle effects, um, 2D sprites. You can animate all these different things within timeline. Um, it's not specific to just 3D elements. So. Um, Just jump over to this project, which is loading. Come on. Go, Unity. <laughs> I'm going to open this guy up in a little while. All right, is it loaded? All right. Okay, we're crashing and burning right now. OK. <laughs> That's not going. All right. Okay. Apparently that one's not. We're going to leave that. So I think we're going to open it up to questions right now. Like we can show a number of different things, but is there? Uh, here we go. Yeah. You can open up to questions, and I'll just show this one quickly. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. That's right. Well, by default, we've actually got three, I think. There's activation, animation, and then audio. Cinemachine actually extended that. It, all, all Cinemachine is is actually tying into the playable system. 
So Cinemachine as a package was separate, and then they added the timeline integration. So you, and once you have, you can create custom track types, you can create custom clip types, custom mixers. If you wanted to find how your specific thing blends, whatever it is, you can, uh, there's a talk tomorrow afternoon on the playable system. So you can actually completely extend all of that stuff. And that's all Cinemachine has done. Um, and here we've actually got sort of a, an example, simple custom track, timeline. And there's also this bait, uh, playable track, which is actually kind of, we have a simple playable that you can actually customize and add your own clip types. So in this particular example here, um, we've actually got, I think, a couple of custom playable tracks. Yeah, so this one is actually an alpha blend. It's where I'm just blending from, uh, I think it's actually blending the, oh yeah, so this, this fade to black. It's actually just a full screen UI element. Like I've just got a full screen UI element that I just animated the alpha. And this playable is actually just animating the alpha of that sprite. So you can actually extend it and um, customize it however you want. So here in this particular example, we've got um, this little intro sequence. So you can think of it, like even in this intro sequence, if it loads, when it loads, um, we've got, you can, it's the first time. All right, here we go. So that, even that initial fade was actually a separate timeline that runs, and all it does is to play on awake and does the fade in. And here we've actually got a very, very light free look. So even on your menu screen, I can actually control the camera a little bit. It's super attenuated. And then if I jump in, it animates UI elements. These are just panels and sprites. We've, we're doing the, the fade in there. Um, these characters are actually being driven on a nav mesh. They're just, I've just animated actually their target. And so on the, on that, it's just an animation track in timeline, and I'm just setting nav mesh target set destination as he moves around. So it... Hello. Um, yep. So I think in the keynote you showed how you can deal with if your camera can't actually see the target because it's behind something. Yeah, yeah. But I think that just did hard cuts. Uh, what, what do you suggest for kind of more... Do you want to... I can, I can bounce over that. I'll bounce yeah. over that. Yeah, let's show you that. So... The shot evaluation is interesting. We, we had these really ambitious ideas to do, or we still do, to do like some uh, you know, crazy analysis, but it, works, it actually works really simply on, on two, two premises. So one is we do a line of sight, and that's the target. So it's not down the camera's Z, it's actually where the camera's looking. And if that line of sight gets cut, then that camera is considered not a very good camera, so that's invalid. And the next, we have this thing called, uh, we call them curb feelers, and it's kind of like this porcupine around the camera, and you can set it, and they're like, it's like bristles coming out. And if the camera gets bumped, every time it gets bumped, we lower its score. So if a camera just gets nudged, or it's like just backed against the wall, or just kind of lightly tapped, then it's okay. It's not as good as a camera that's completely unmolested, but it's, it's not bad. And then the more the camera gets beat up by the environment, the more that it, uh, the more that the ranking goes down. So let me show you that. So I'm going to just hit the timeline here. We got those guys. I'm going to try to rectify the situation where that state-driven camera is not working. And it works. I'm not sure why it didn't work in the scene today, but it does. So uh, these are different tracks. So I've got this Cinemachine uh, shot. And I'm just going to hook this up to uh, demo scene, root, Cinemachine. Okay, so here's how it goes. We've got this clip, and I'm going to put in the clear shot uh, as a camera. So I just created a new clear shot, and I'm going to just drag some cameras into it. These can be any cameras you want, any cameras that are in your scene, any virtual cameras. I'm going to delete this, and you go to the clip, drag the clear shot onto it, and then your question, can it blend? So right now, it's on an ease in and ease out, or it can be ease in, hard out, linear, cut. You can even set up a custom blend arrangement for what to do, like if, it's, if camera one's happening and then that gets invalid, I want to blend to camera two, or I want to cut to camera two. So you can create an entire state machine for that. So look at that here. I can just add multiple cameras and say, 
from any camera or from this camera to that camera, ease in, ease out, and go crazy and do whatever you'd like. And this is how it works. So I'm going to unhide the walls, which are right here. I'm going to show you the shot evaluation. So I'm looking at this guy's neck. You saw this uh, perhaps in the keynote, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a deeper dive onto it. The second these guys get in the way of that shot, it cuts. See right there, I'm just like, just uh, cut. But it works backwards too. Like I, I can grab the camera you here and it's the fine. Red, the red porcupine on, on the camera, that's the collider. Yeah. Raycast. So this little guy, see that the, the porcupine here? That's the collider and that's the collider distance. So in the Cinemachine Collider, this is a separate component. You can put this on any virtual camera. Camera collisions are like, as you guys might know, super hard and they're really quite tricky. And I don't think there's ever a perfect solution, but this, we spent a lot of time on it. And you can just put the collider on any virtual camera and then you've got a whole bunch of collision system guys which are uh, you know, right here, um, ready working for you. So you look at this, here's a curve feeler distance. See, I'm kind of changing this distance. And then there's the line of sight. So look, it works backwards too. I can take the camera, and this is all valid, but as soon as I move the camera out of the way, it'll cut to the next one. You see that? It's like cut, cut. You know, and you can like, anytime that shot's invalid. And what was inspired by this is uh, I worked on a driving game and uh, we had these car crashes and we never knew where they would happen, but we wanted to like, you know, wide angle and arc over top and push zoom in and like create this cinematic event. But, you know, it could happen anywhere. You could be in a tunnel. So what we do is with, a, with this clear shot set up is you would make a bunch of cameras, but you'd make like one safety camera for every edit, which was like a really, really close camera. So you'd always have like a safe one. And then what's interesting about this is, you know, when you say, I'm going to use the car crash example, you have a car crash, you trigger a timeline, you play this one clear shot, but you can play a whole bunch more. And then what you can do is you can make, you know, I'm going to just make a whole bunch more. You make a bunch more clips. And each one of these is a clear shot. And you get where I'm going. And the other one's down here. And then what you're doing is like, this is a clear shot just for wide angles. And this is a clear shot just for telephotos. And this is another one, this is another one. And let's say you've got a particular audio track. You can put like the ideas on the beat so it still fits within the music, but you're guaranteed to always have a wide shot that works. And then you're guaranteed to always have a telephoto shot that works. So you can make these like really kind of sculpted cutscenes, but every camera inside them is smart and is, will get out of the way and move to the next one if it doesn't have a clear shot on it. So, you know, or like a player intro. Imagine having, you know, like every time a player intros, every time you start the game, you want to have like this little sequence. Well, here's your wide shot at the start. It calls three sub cameras, and then this one, and this has its own three sub cameras, and so on. And then you check on this little button here, it says random. Randomized choice. And if you did three cameras here, three cameras here, three cameras here, you've now got this matrix. And every time you play the game intro, it'll go from like camera one, camera two for the next one, and camera three for the next one, or whatever. And you've now made like this, you know, random, different every time, but you don't, uh, you know, you don't have to make a whole pile of cameras. So it's really, it's, it's really quite versatile. You can use it in a lot of different ways. All right, let's jump to another question. So. Hi, my name is Tumshiri. I have two questions actually. One of them is the performance issue. For clear shot, uh, for this example, for example, we have three camera, and th those are going to be active, I guess to have the which one is seeing or not. Yeah. And this is going to be costing a bit. How is it working? Yeah, so the cost is actually incredibly light. Having a, a virtual camera active um, is next to no cost. We've profiled the scene with like 10,000 virtual cameras and it's like, it's, they're incredibly light. The other but, thing is it's not evaluating the sub cameras until that first one is invalid. That's right. So it's only, it's only checking, it's like, hey, I'm good. Okay, I'm not good, now figure out what the next one is. Okay. So it's like the, the moment, and it just goes down your priority list. So it's not always it, on. So yeah, and the virtual right. cameras themselves are very lightweight. It's just basically updating a transform in your main camera. There's a but though, the uh, collider, 
the Raycasts have a bit of a cost to them. Yeah, that, yes. that's, that was the, actually one of the things going to cost you. Yeah, so yeah. we've talked to a couple of developers that are doing mobile development, and they're doing like GPU Raycasting and all kinds of fancy stuff. So we're sort of working to expose that so you can actually tell the, or tell the, the clear shot that you think this is a good camera if you're not using the physics Raycast or something. And we've decoupled them. You can see there's two switches here. There's the line of sight and then there's the curve feelers. So if you don't need one, like if you don't care about the camera bumping up against a wall or something, you can turn that whole system off. And this is to be mobile friendly, or at least to optimize it as much as we can. But it does load physics up, and, and if you're not using physics, you might want to question loading it up just for this feature. Okay. The second one is like uh, you say the timeline API is easy to use. You can call it always somewhere else. But how it's going to be working for callbacks? What if I want to get some callback on the one point of the animation and activate the another thing? So is it going to be like the animation event system or something else? Yeah, so we've actually got a, a simple a custom playable that we've, we're providing as, a, as an example in our playable library that we're, we're working on. And it allows you to actually hook in Unity events. Um, there's a couple of different approaches. I've hooked in just um, like my own custom messaging system that I have. Um, on, uh, in the keynote demos, I was using it to like, say, like, here's the end of the cutscene, enable the player. Um, so there, there's a couple of different ways. There are also, in, uh, not in 2017.1, but in future ones, we're looking at just like, general callbacks for timeline, like when the sequence is done. You can access within the playable director component, like the current time, you can say jump to time, move to time. You could use it like a flash style workflow, like they go to frame and play. And you can sort of integrate and customize it into your workflow. Thank you. Any other questions? Sure. Yeah, we've got three minutes left, so let's get a couple more. Can you track multiple targets? And uh -huh. can those targets be more than just a point? So Great like question. track the entire oh, that's balance. That's a fantastic question. You can. Uh, so there's two ways of doing it. We've got this thing called group target camera. And if you can see here, I just go to Cinemachine and go group target camera. And what this thing does is it creates a object and you add as many sub objects to it as you want. And you can dynamically populate these or these can just be things in the world. And these are just transforms. And then it gives you a control for its group center and its group average. So you can say, We've got a rotation mode thing. But basically what this does is this, based on your weight and based on a radius that you set, will create a virtual center point based on all the different things that are out there. And you can adjust the weights and kind of bias it. And so then now you've got something to look at. So then you can then set Cinemachine to look at this thing. And then there's actually one more uh, thing. So I'm actually, I don't have all those objects flying around but I'll just kind of have to do it. So we're going to look at this thing. And then under AIM, we've got the composer, but we've got this new composer called a group composer. And what the group composer does is it gives you a framing size. So actually, why don't we just do this for real? I'm going to just take this. we got three guys in there. we got three guys in this scene. I mean, it's in our laps. Uh, so I'm going to just pick some like the, 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 the side. Yes, thank you. This mouse is really tricky. Here we go. So I'm going to just delete this. I'm going to put the three dudes in there. I think I can even have more on the list, and it doesn't matter. OK, and I know the characters are down here, so I'm just going to pick the characters really quick, chuck them in there. OK, so we got Adam. We got crowd this guy. We got crowd this guy. OK, we're going to wait them all. One. So you can see now that this thing, this target group, we've created this like virtual position. And it's between these three, these guys. And it, it kind of is. And if I were to play with this weight right here, go zero, you know, you'll see it's, you can mix and match, it'll blend, it'll, you know, it'll define its position. So then I get this virtual camera, which is right here. I'm just going to move it like this. I'm going to have a look at these guys. And I'm going to make a clip that's just the virtual camera, just because I want that to be the main guy that's on right now. Put that there. Throw the virtual camera on that guy. 
Okay. So then what we do is, I'm just going to move a little bit closer. It accounts for the screen size of these objects. So look at this. Virtual camera two. No, five, four. Sorry, three. we're counting down. Uh, All right, we're out of time. I'm sorry, we're going to run out of time. <laughs> Uh, there, we're going to have a tutorial on this, but I'll just sum this up in saying we spent a lot of time on what this group composer can do, and you set the, how big you'd like it on screen, and then you can set a horizontal and vertical, uh, the size, and then you can say, I want a dolly first, or I want to zoom, or I want to zoom and dolly for how it, the camera moves to keep the multiple targets on screen. All right, so. we want to thank you guys for your time. There's yeah. actually three more Timeline Cinema Machine talks. There's one later on this afternoon, and then two more tomorrow. The, the later one tomorrow is actually diving really into the playable system, the actual code underneath everything. And then there's another one where Andy, one of the field uh, engineers, is going to show you a whole bunch of other crazy things he's done. He's built weather systems and time of day and all kinds of cool stuff. So come, come tomorrow and later on today. It's all in the schedule. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. <laughs>